thank you very much, and um, I'm excited to be here. And, uh, in a minute, I'll pass on to Andrew, who will talk about uh, uh, all things Roman in Perth and Kinross. That is very much outside my area of expertise. Um, so uh, uh, very happy to have Andrew's input there. Um, so the Iron Age in Perth and Kinross is uh, uh, unlike maybe the Neolithic, uh, uh, does have some distinctive characteristics in its kind of uh, mixing up uh, of the Iron Age. So on a whole, the Iron Age in Scotland tends to have this kind of east-west divide. Um, and Perth and Canross has a lot of characteristics of both. Uh, and that is uh, something that is definitely worth exploring. Um, <clears throat> The HER in Perth and Kinross is dominated uh, in the Iron Age by uh, uh, sort of knowledge that's been, pro been produced through sort of key excavations. Uh, and these have been going on uh, since the late 19th century uh, with some very uh, famous excavations of Castle Law, for instance, uh, where we have the fabulous timber lacing uh, in the ramparts. Uh, there's several examples of that elsewhere uh, that have been excavated in the 19th century and much more recently as well. Um, a sort of the very earliest uh, uh, understanding of the Iron Age comes from the 18th century even, uh, where people describe uh, uh, many of these monuments, um, usually being attributed to uh, 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 sort of foreign um, Scandinavian or Roman uh, in invaders or settlers. Um, uh, but it's worth pointing out um, uh, that uh, the first person perhaps to actually recognize um, uh, that that wasn't the case was in fact a woman um, uh, in the 19th century Christian uh, uh, who is uh, there's a great biography in um, Mary Davies PhD um, uh, about her um, and so that's worth going to point uh, worth pointing out um, moving forward uh, there have been uh, several major research programs uh, in the past few decades um, notably, the SURF project tackling hill forts um, has really opened up a lot of what we know about the Iron Age in Perth and Kinross. Uh, there's been a lot of new commercial uh, data that has come out of uh, pre-development work. Um, and of course, the project that I'm working on, the Living on Water Project investigating Cranogs and Octe, um, has tackled a lot of uh, questions we've had about the early Iron Age in particular uh, in the development uh, of the use of uh, Cranogs in in Perth and Kinross. Um, something that I think is worth pointing out uh, for problems and challenges moving forward with uh, uh, the HER and uh, the recording of archaeology is the explosion of data that is about to occur um, with LIDAR um, and uh, automated feature detection. Um, and I think if we, we should really start to think about that now uh, before uh, we are overloaded, um, uh, flooded with data um, and if we really want to use these records as a, a research tool, um, uh, now is the time to get that sorted before we are overwhelmed with data. Um, so in Perth and Kinross, we've got just over 2,000 sites uh, that are nominally Iron Age. Um, uh, there's lots of problems there, and we'll go into that in a minute. Um, the vast majority are settlement related. Um, uh, there, we don't have uh, really many other kinds of uh, monuments dating to the Iron Age, uh, really in, in all of Scotland. Significant spatial patterns are evident. These are environmental and geologic, as we heard about earlier, um, but they're also uh, related to the history of research. Um, so we heard about the Southeast Perth uh, Royal Commission Survey. I'm pointing out here the Northeast Perth, Northeast Perth uh, Royal Commission Survey. Um, so that density of sites up there in the Northeast uh, is very much related to just the fact that somebody's had a look. Um, and I can uh, almost guarantee that if we went into other similar locations around um, uh, Perth and Kinross that you would get a similar density of, of sites recorded. Um, also wanted to point out there are frequent inconsistencies in the records. Um, and so this is something if uh, we're going to use the record as a research tool, um, some of these inconsistencies are going to need to be sorted out. Inconsistencies uh, within um, the HER and inconsistencies between the Perth and Kinross HER and the Canmore, the national record. Um, now, this graph uh, is not particularly helpful, so I'm glad that it's fairly illegible. Um, that kind of proves the point. Um, and it proves the point that essentially uh, what we're looking at is a, 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 a domestic record for the Iron Age. Um, sort of variations on a theme of the roundhouse, 
uh, enclosures, which may be Iron Age, but as Kenny pointed out, they could be just about any period. Um, lots of those records fall into this um, uh, type. And of course, the hut circle, um, which is that big spike in the record there. Um, uh, many of these are probably Iron Age. Uh, many of them are probably not Iron Age. And many of them are probably Iron Age and other periods as well, Bronze Age notably. Um, the burial records which fall into the Perth and Kinross HER, I've not come across a single one that is actually Iron Age. Um, and I would be very interested to hear from somebody who actually could point me to a known, confirmed example of an Iron Age burial um, in Perth and Kinross, because I've not been able to, to really come across one. And then, of course, there's the Roman remains, uh, which I will leave to, to Andrew. Um, so that brings me on to, to sort of our knowledge gaps, and I, I've, I've sort of introduced this. I think we actually really should have some, some questions about the HER itself. Um, I think it's a, it has potential to be a fantastic tool for actual research in and of itself, but we need to, we need to be able to get to that place w that we can do that in the, in the first instance. Um, so one of the unique things about Perth and Kinross's Iron Age um, uh, uh, history of research is the use of uh, specific terminology to this part of the country, uh, in, uh, in particular the use of the term homestead. Um, homesteads being these kind of dry stone structures that aren't dissimilar from dunes or brocks, perhaps. Um, uh, I think it's a question, should we continue to use this? It's not something that really gets used outside of Perth and Sterling, really. Um, it, but it uh, can perhaps confuse uh, uh, some of the similarities between that type of architecture and uh, the architecture more typically of Western Scotland. Um, there's a, a, a lot of potential in the HER to sort of elucidate patterns of settlement, but only if we get to that point where we can um, uh, filter out some of those inconsistencies and also have a better um, uh, sort of level of understanding within the HER of chronology, um, where it's good, where we have it confirmed and known from particular sites, where it's suspected, uh, and where it's absolutely unknown. Um, <clears throat> the true number of different sites is also important. Uh, I'm sure Matt has come across this with hut circles. Uh, you get a record for hut circle, parenthesis, S, parent, N parenthesis, um, and that could be 30 hut circles. Um, so if we're going to assume that the number and pattern of uh, types of roundhouses uh, is meaningful, um, we really need to know how many there are and where they are. Um, and uh, so the next major gap uh, that I've identified is very much uh, reflecting my own bias. Um, and this has to do with where my head is at the moment uh, as regards to the Living on Water project. And that is the nature of the early Iron Age. Um, this might be the only period you hear about today that's sort of defined by what it doesn't have rather than what it actually has. Um, so we, uh, there is essentially no archaeology in Perth and Kinross that you can confidently put your finger on and say that dates to the very earliest Iron Age in the period 800 to 600 BC. Um, there's maybe a couple suspected sites, um, but there's essentially nothing that you can kind of really touch and say, yeah, that's definitely from that period. And that's not uncommon throughout the country. Um, that's a pretty, pretty common situation. Um, but uh, I mean, I can point out the, the national panel um, sort of threw out this very broad sweeping question, but it remains um, uh, very pertinent today. And you know, that is you know, what were people doing and what ultimately drove the adoption of Iron Age lifeways that included um, you know, the use of these diverse uh, monumental roundhouses and enclosures. If we're going to assume that the Iron Age is an important transition, which I think we'd all agree it was, um, we really need to actually understand that transition period in that very earliest part of the Iron Age. Um, and uh, what goes on to dominate the Iron Age in Perth and Kinross and, and most of the rest of the country is this kind of use of very elaborate and monumental roundhouses. Um, uh, uh, but so far, there's really no pattern um, or uh, understanding of the development of that, uh, what comes first, what different types are used, um, and of course, why. Um, and that sort of leads on to um, my next one. I put in this last question here about iron as well, um, relating to that transition. If we assume that this is somehow a significant transition, we really should be looking for the actual physical evidence for it. Um, if that's not going to come from 
the survival of iron, which is uh, understandable given the preservation conditions uh, in Perth and Kinross, then we should be looking for it in other ways, um, perhaps paleoenvironmental signals. Um, but this question about uh, uh, sort of monumental roundhouses sort of le leads on to my next gap, which is if we're going to assume that there is significance to the different types of roundhouses that we find across Perth and Kinross, um, then we really need to have models for that diversity of settlement. Um, we need to have explicit models. Even better, we should have testable hypotheses um, for why there are is very broad range <clears throat> of different roundhouses, whether that's homesteads, these kind of dry stone structures with uh, 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 timber constructions, timber only roundhouses, ring ditched houses, um, these kind of diversity of forms of roundhouses need to have an explanation. Or, I might suggest, we just deal with them as a single group. Um, until you can actually put your finger on uh, an, exp an explanation as to why we're seeing these different types of roundhouses, I'm not sure we should actually really think about them as different types of roundhouses. Um, they are essentially just Iron Age houses, um, whether they're hut circles or cranogs or homesteads. Um, but if you do believe that there's something significant going on here and that there is a difference between these types of roundhouses, um, then we really need to find a, a pattern um, or sequence to their continued use, not only their emergence in that early Iron Age period, um, but how they then uh, get con uh, are continued to be used throughout the period. Um, and ultimately, what we're trying to do there is, is unpick why do you choose to build one type of roundhouse versus another. Um, I think that's ultimately where you need to go, uh, unless, of course, you treat them as a singular unit. Um, And this leads on to sort of my next knowledge gap, um, and that is, um, you know, that chronology is really key uh, to identifying changes. Um, it's no longer good enough, I think, to just grab a handful of radiocarbon dates from a series of features. Um, radiocarbon dating has, since its invention, I think, really led our understanding of the Iron Age in Scotland, and Perth and Kinross is no exception. Um, but unfortunately, in the Iron Age, we deal with, uh, in, in the first part of the Iron Age, certainly, these two um, plateaus in the calibration curve, and that can really mask uh, any kind of changes um, that take place. And I think this is one of the reasons why um, Iron Age studies in Scotland and Perth and Kinross as well um, have focused on uh, the Roman presence in the country, um, because it's actually, it's an identifiable change that we have um, you know, in a moment in time. We can, we can put our finger on it. We can say that actually happened at that time. Any other changes, which certainly happened in society, economy, and climate, um, are masked by uh, these uh, uh, flat spots in the radiocarbon calibration curve. Um, you know, we've got sort of 14 centuries, uh, 12 centuries of, of Iron Age activity. We can fairly safely assume that there were lots of major shifts in life. Um, through that time, um, but the kind of broad picture when you're looking at it is this, you know, mixed pastoral um, economy living in round architecture, um, and then in some parts of, of Perth and Kinross, the Romans show up for a little while, uh, and then life carries on, and that really goes on right into the first millennium AD, and we're still using the same types of settlement, um, and it's not until you get into that really kind of second half of the first millennium AD that things start to identifiably change in the archaeological record, um, in particular in terms of the kinds of settlement types that are being used. Um, so if we want to unpick those differences, if we want to be able to unpick um, the changes uh, that occurred in settlement, economy, etc., cetera, um, we need to uh, come to grips with using radiocarbon. And it will be radiocarbon uh, uh, that we will rely on um, uh, to be able to do that. Um, and so with that, I will hand over to Andrew. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we're eating into the coffee break. And if you're like me, my brain's starting to go to sleep. So I will try and keep this quite quick and brief. Um, like I think Gavin said, um, Perth is at the heart of Scotland, where the crossroads We've been very lucky that we've had antiquarians galore coming through the region 
um, recording various lumps and bumps in the area. And into the sort of early 19th, uh, sorry, late 19th and early 20th century, we've got major excavations of some of the sites in the area, giving us great information, not quite the levels of information we want today. Um, we've had some smaller excavations as well, which all of them have been very important. And, and they really led to us having a very good, strong knowledge of what's happening in Persia in parts of the Roman period. We've, we've got 20th century, we move into aerial photography, which has had a huge impact on our knowledge of, of Roman Scotland, particularly picking up um, camps and some forts that have been unknown. Um, we've, we've, as I say, got a great knowledge um, of the Flavian period. Um, most of the forts on that have been um, geophysically surveyed. Uh, some of the towers, some of them have been excavated. Um, but thinking about what, what we also know, dating, I think everybody sort of mentioned dating is problematic for their periods. We've got four uh, Roman periods that are really happening here in Perthshire. Um, Flavian, we have quite good knowledge. Beyond Flavian, our knowledge is a lot more limited. We've not done as much work on Antonine sites or Severan sites. Um, we've got a Hadrianic coin from the camp at Fortivia. These are all questions that, that we need to think more about. So fortifications, um, Inch Tuthel, the fortress, we've got great information on that. As I say, forts and towers of the Flavian periods are great. Our investigations of camps have been a lot more limited um, than, than we probably should be. We should be thinking more about those. Kintour up in Aberdeen um, was excavated a few years ago now, and the environmental data that came out of that um, sort of put our knowledge on leaps and bounds. We got radiocarbon dating. Um, we need to be thinking about trying to do more of that sort of work on camps in Perthshire. Um, a lot of our, our dating um, comes from sort of typological analysis based on size, based on gate types. We, we don't have too many finds from camps, um, and even some of the forts were a bit limited on our finds. Um, so there's a bit of academic debate on the Flavian period, because that's what we know most about in Perthshire. Um, the purpose of some of the, the sites, what, why are they coming into Perthshire? Is it that they're intending to secure the area? Are they building the fortifications, the gas ridge, forts and towers? Is it to have a secure supply line? Or is it because they're just solidifying the end of the, the sort of Roman frontier zone up here? And then we've got the Highland Line forts, sometimes known as Glen Blockers, um, also sometimes known as the Outer Limes. Um, these are a series of fortifications at the entrances to glens. Um, I think it was Richmond in the 1930s decided there were glen blockers, and that's kind of stuck. But we don't know, again, the purpose of those. Are they to launch invasions into the highlands that never happened? Are they to secure the Roman zone from people coming down from the highlands? Or is it just part of solidifying the Roman frontier zone? So we've got... A distinct lack of information about the indigenous landscape and that, and the interaction between the Roman military and the local population. Now, the classical sources such as Tacitus tells us that it was quite violent, ended up in a big battle at Mons Graupius. There's very little in the archaeological record to support that. That's not to say it didn't happen. It probably means we've just not found it yet. We have a lack of social data, so we don't know any cemeteries or settlements or religious buildings, things that are happening elsewhere in the empire. Um, that really doesn't tell us anything about who's following the army. We know that families would follow, traders, children. We have no evidence for any of that up here. And again, I don't think it's because it wasn't happening. I think it's just because we've not found it. Cemeteries and settlements are the places where we find this information. Um, a lot of the work that's happened on forts to date has happened within the fortification itself rather than the surrounding area. And it was something mentioned in the national framework um, on the Roman period that we need to start looking outside of the fortifications, partly for settlements, but partly for trade, see what interaction is happening. Um, we've not really had a synthesis of Roman objects um, for Persia, um, Angus, uh, Aberdeenshire. 
so we don't know what trade is going on. We've, we've got lots of little pockets of things that might be Roman that are found in, in hill forts and that. And, and again, I think it's time that we need to think about doing a synthesis of that to see if there is a relationship going on or are they purely just here as a military in conquer and then get withdrawn. Roads and river networks, this is kind of my bias. Um, this is what I'm really interested in. Certainly in the Flavian period, we're told uh, that the rivers are being used for invasion. Um, certainly in Germany, when Agricola tackles there and then he comes over to Britain um, and brings the fleet with him and starts uh, using the rivers to invade. Um, we've, we've done no analysis of that. We've, we've not done a modern synthesis of how that fits in with the archaeological landscape. Um, there's general assumptions that there's one road, um, Roman road, sort of heading off northeast to Aberdeenshire. Um, we kind of, again, need to do a synthesis of all these little pockets. We have a lot of antiquarian accounts, this bit of road here and there. We need to kind of pull it together. Um, and also, as part of that, look at the river crossings and that. So we have an alleged Roman bridge at Bertha. Um, hints of it being found, we've never done any modern analysis of it. We've got great aerial photographs of what looks like the line of the road going up um, on the other side of the Tay. Um, but curiously, you have things like the fort at Grassy Walls, which is a severe fort, and it's on top of the Roman road. Um, not even following the line of it, it's bang on top of it. So things like that, we need to have a look at what they were up to, what's their sort of original strategy, and how does it fit in with the later invasions. Um, environmental analysis, we're hugely lacking this for the Roman period, um, mainly because a lot of our, our large-scale excavations happened 100 years ago. Not soil analysis, pollen analysis wasn't really a big thing then. Um, Curl in 1911 is doing it at, at Newstead, but that doesn't seem to get replicated too far and wide. And we need to be thinking now about what's surrounding the forts, the landscape, the environment. We can hopefully any modern excavation comes up with organic material, we can start to look at dating it. I actually think we need to be going out to some of these sites and the environment around them and starting to take core samples and having a look at this information, um, not just for dating it, but to actually find out more about what's the environment like up here. We, we've got good analysis of central Scotland. It kind of tails off north of the Antonine Wall. Um, modern technology and research has come on leaps and bounds, particularly in the last 20 years. Uh, I think, as Michael was saying, LiDAR data is now becoming commonplace. We can send drones up. Um, we can start to map sites. We can start to do an all analysis. This is really important. gives us a great picture, again, of the environment around the, the fortifications. Um, and it also potentially can lead us to... to learning if there are settlements and that we can do all this quite cheaply and easily. One of the big areas we have an issue with is that we do have a lot of data that's been taken and published. The raw data isn't available for researchers uh, commonly. Um, a lot of it has been lost, a lot of it has been archived. Electronic data archives degrade and all that. We need to make the raw data available because when new techniques come along, you can take that raw data, analyze it in a different way. Um, I, th I think that's something, again, we need to be encouraging more researchers to be looking at the Romans in, in Scotland in Perthshire. Making this data available means that we can get PhD students, master's students analysing it simply and easily, but it gives us useful information and data. So, very, very quickly, um, I've got really sort of six questions. Um, issues with the, the lack of datable evidence. Um, Reanalysis of the fortifications. Um, and say we've got a lot of major excavations that happened, we need to look at those again if that information still exists. Um, we need to find out more about the local population, how they're interacting with the Romans. Is there a population coming with the army that tends to happen elsewhere? Um, the, the road and river network, at, analyzing that, will that tell us more about supply lines, what the Roman intentions were in the area, and troop movements, where were they going, where did they come from? Um, again, profiling, environmental and landscape profiling of sites would be hugely beneficial to us. And sort of deploying new techniques. It's great because I'm down in Durham, I can get some data, I can come up and gather data, I can sit 
when it stays like this and you can't do much, I can sit at my desk and learn so much more. And I think we need to be putting that at the forefront of our thinking. There you go. Marvelous.